Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading. First Chronicles chapter 29, please. First Chronicles and chapter 29. We're going to read the first nine verses of First Chronicles chapter 29. And we'll read the verses responsibly, as we normally do. We'll begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we'll alternate together till we end together on verse number 9. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word. Let's begin together on verse 1 of First Chronicles chapter 29. Ready? Furthermore, David the king said unto all the congregation, Solomon my son, whom alone God hath chosen, is yet young and tender, and the work is great, for the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the gold for things to be made of gold, the silver for things of silver, the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, the wood for things of wood, onyx stones and stones to be set, glistering stones and of diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble stones in abundance." Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have of mine own proper good of gold and silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. Even three thousand talents of gold, of the gold of Ophir, and seven thousand talents of refined silver, to overlay the walls of the houses withal. The gold for the things of gold, and the silver for things of silver, and for all manner of work to be made by the hands of artificers, 
And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? Then the chief of the fathers and princes of the tribes of Israel and the captains of thousands and of hundreds with the rulers of the king's work offered willingly and gave for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams and of silver 10,000 talents and of brass 18,000 talents and 100,000 talents of iron. And they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced for that they offered willingly because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. And let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you that we hold copies in our hands this morning. Lord, we're such a privileged people this morning. It's been wonderful to have the fellowship with the people of God and freely do it in this place. Wonderful to sing the songs of God and to listen to the songs of God. It's been a tremendous encouragement and blessing just to be in church this morning. And so, Lord, we're praying now that you will bless the special and you'll continue to prepare our hearts so we're ready to receive the, the message, the truth from your word this morning. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. My heart can sing when I pause to remember a heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward. This troubled world is not my final home. But until then, my heart will go on singing. Until then, with joy I'll carry on. Until the day my eyes behold that city. Until the day God calls me home. The things of earth will dim and lose their value If we recall they're borrowed for a while And things of earth that cause a heart to tremble Remembered there will only bring a smile but until then my heart will go on singing until then with joy i'll carry on until the day my eyes behold that city until the day god calls me home this weary world with all its toll and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife the soul of man is like a waiting falcon when it's released it's destined for the skies but until then my heart will go on singing and until then what joy i'll carry Until the day God calls me home. Amen. 
Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the message of the morning hour. Lord, we're asking you to help us today to quiet our mind and our spirit. Help us, Lord, to not be distracted by things that maybe we still have to do later today. Lord, other things that would capture our thoughts and our mind and cause us to miss what you would want to say to us this morning. So open now our eyes that we could behold wondrous things out of your law this morning. Holy Spirit of God, be our teacher today and help both the, the, the speaker and the listener this morning as only you can. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for what's accomplished in our hearts today. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Helen Keller was once asked if there's anything worse than being born blind. And she replied, yes, there is. It's being born with sight and having no vision. David had a vision. His vision was to build a house for God. He had a great desire in his heart that he had a great house to live in, a great palace to, to, that the king could dwell in. But the king of kings, who he served, the Lord of lords, whom he loved, had no dwelling place. And so he had it in his heart to build a house for God. And it would be a great place. Uh, he mentioned in our reading that the work was great because the palace is not for man, but for the Lord God. And, and so David had big plans, but I want you to notice, if you will with me, back in chapter 28, just for a moment, that he was getting instructions of this from God. Now, God told David he would not build it. If you notice with me in verse number 3, God said unto me, Thou shalt not build a house for me or for my name, because thou hast been a man of war and hast shed blood. And he basically tells him, You won't build it. Your son Solomon will build it. I'll give him peaceful times and he'll be able to build the, the temple for me. And, and so he tells Solomon in verse number 9, he said, Know thou the God of thy fathers, serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord hath chosen thee to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. So he encourages him to get the job done and then he gives him something in verse 11. It says, He gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and the houses thereof and the treasuries thereof and all the upper chambers thereof and the inner parlors thereof and the, pal and the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. If you go all the way back down to verse 19, he says, All this, said David, the Lord made me understand in writing by His hand upon me even all the works of this pattern. David launches the project and, and, and God gives him the blueprints. And so he he's following the blueprint that God gave him. But you know what's great? I, I, what I like about David is he had in his heart to do something great for God. You know, there, there ought to be somewhere, there ought to be somebody somewhere that just has something in their heart that they want to do something great for God. That, 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 that we can, as, as George Mueller used to quote, open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. Where are some Christians today that will say, oh, I want to open my mouth wide. I want to see God do something big in my lifetime. I don't want to look for something little. I don't want to be a pucker mouth Christian. I want to be a wide mouth Christian. I want God to do something big in my life. And so it's exciting for David. I'm sure exciting for Solomon as he looks at the job that has to get done. And we understand something. If something's going to get done, if the house is going to get built, they're going to have to establish some heavenly priorities. Their priorities are going to have to be, be important. And we all need priorities. Priorities are not what we say they are, it's what we live. Okay? Uh, a lot of times we talk a good priority and we don't live such a good priority. 
I was reading about a young professional, very prosperous investment banker. He was driving a brand new BMW sedan on a mountain road. It began to snow, and as he veered around one sharp turn, he lost control and began sliding off the road. He was going toward the edge of the mountain and about to go over the cliff, and at the last moment he unbuckled his seatbelt and flung open the door and jumped. The car went on over the cliff and burst into flames at the bottom of the cliff and he escaped with his life. However, he realized that he had suffered a very horrible injury. His arm had caught on the door, the hinge of the door, as he jumped and it was tore off at his shoulder. A passing trucker saw the accident in his rearview mare and he pulled his rig to a halt and he ran back to see if he could help the man. The man was just standing there, oblivious to his injury. He was just moaning, my BMW, my brand new BMW. And the trucker pointed to his shoulder and he said, man, you got bigger problems than that. you got to find your arm. Maybe they can sew it back on and maybe they can still save it if we can find it. And that's when he looked at his arm and he said, my Rolex, my brand new Rolex. Priorities. We all have our priorities. And sometimes they're not what we say they are, but how we live. I want to talk to you a little bit today about heavenly priorities. Heavenly priorities. They, 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 they're building a house for God and it's going to take some heavenly priorities. The first priority I want you to see is it took, heaven, it took preparation. The first priority was preparation. David is counting the cost and preparing the resources to build the house. Notice what he said in verse 2 of chapter 29. David said, Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God. I, uh, David didn't do it half-heartedly. David didn't do it ho-humbly. David didn't do it just mediocrely, mediocrity or in, in, a, in a half-hearted way. Not apathetic at all. He prepared with all his might. He did it with everything he had. Hey, that's a word we don't hear a lot of nowadays, but it's zealousness. It's a zeal for God. And David said, as much as I had a zeal to fight the giant, as much as I had a zeal to lead the armies of Israel in battle, where Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands, and, and David, the mighty warrior, he said, I have that much zeal to do something for God and prepare for the house of God. I like the fact he prepared zealously. He prepared affectionately. Affectionately. His heart was in it with all of his might. He's saying, I love the house of God. And, and I think it's a great thing. Listen, where are the men today that will say, I love the house of God? I love the things of God. Oh, I can find the men who love sports. I can find the men who love to work. I can find the men who maybe love cars or guns or hunting or, or, or their coin collection. And, and men are passionate about many things. Where are the men who will say, my passion and my heart and my love is for the house of God. That's what I live for. Their affection is for God. And he prepared affectionately because he loved the house of God. He loved the work of God. When the ushers took the offering up one Sunday morning, they brought the plates back to the altar, back up to the pulpit. The preacher took the plates and he held them up in the air and he offered this prayer to God. Lord, regardless of what we say about you, this is what we really think about you. This is what we really feel about you. Amen. Boy, that's quiet. You see, David began to not only zealously prepare and affectionately prepare, he sacrificially prepared. He said, 
He gave the gold for the things of gold, the silver for things of silver, and on through verse 2. Then notice verse 3, because I have set my affection to the house of my God. Notice I have of my own proper good of gold and silver which I have given to the house of my God over and above all that I prepared for the holy house. I believe verse 2 was things that he had taken in through taxation, things that just came in for the kingdom. But I think in verse 3 was his own personal accounts from his own personal treasury, his own personal wealth. And David gave sacrificially. Based, let me break it down for you. 110 tons of gold and 260 tons of silver. It would have been equivalent to about $2 billion dollars. By the way, the cost of the building of this house of God in our day, $16 billion in our money today. David would have given $2 billion of that himself. And then he asks the question at the end of verse 5. Did you see the question? Who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? The word consecrate there literally means to fill one's hand. It's it's, it's who else has something in their hand that they'll give to this work? Who else would like to do this? And David, David isn't, isn't telling them to do something that he hasn't already done. That he hasn't already committed himself for. And leading by example. In fact, the leaders, you find out the chief of the fathers, verse 6, chief of the fathers, the princes of the tribes of Israel, the captains of thousands, hundreds, rulers of the kings, they offered willingly. And then it lists what they gave. And I'll break it down for you. For us in our, our terminology, they reported and they, they gave 190 tons of gold, 375 tons of silver, 675 tons of bronze, and 3,750 tons of iron, all with a willing heart. They gave, David gave about $2 billion. The leaders, the rulers, the, the, the heads of the tribes, they all put in $4 billion. Well, there's six billion on their way to fourteen billion or sixteen billion. They're on their way now. And they're 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 because they made it listen, that's preparation. Preparation. Preparing. Making sure that's a priority. And that takes some sacrifice. Mo listen, most of us in America, we don't really understand sacrifice. Now yeah, and, and, and that's not easy to admit, but we have to admit that's true. Most of us uh, sacrifice is if the air conditioner goes out. We think, oh, we didn't have any air conditioning for two days. Horrible. How, poor me. Huh? How, many, uh, how many are old enough when you grew up, you didn't have any air conditioning? Huh? Yeah, look at that. As, as, as a sports announcer used to always use an expression, that guy's as cool as the other side of the pillow. How I many you know what that means? Yeah. Well, you have a night and you're hot and you're sweaty. You know what you did? You flipped that pillow and oh man, that felt good. Preparation. That's what we think sacrifice is. But you understand, to do great things for God, it's going to take more than spare change. It's going to take more than spare change to get the job done. Heavenly priorities. Whenever there's success, and you see success in God's work, there's always been sacrifice somewhere. If, if Brother Morton and I have discussed this, that, that probably when you're in, especially when you're in the Bible translation work and you're going to translate Scripture, he probably won't live to see the success of some of those projects but he'll do the sacrifice necessary so that the ones coming behind him will see success. Heavenly priorities, preparation. Then I want you to see the heavenly priority was participation. Participation. David said, I've prepared and given. The leaders have prepared and given. Now who of you are willing to consecrate his service this day under the Lord? And the people, to their credit, said, we're willing. We see what you've done, David. We've seen what our leaders have done. 
Now we're willing to help. We're willing to give. And they were ready. You know, the church was never intended to be subsidized by taxes. The, the, the church, let me help you with something. The, the church of Jesus Christ is not tax exempt. It is non-taxable. In other words, you're not getting some favor from the government to say, well, we'll exempt you from taxes. No, we're not taxable. And there's a difference. They never intended for the church to be taxed. It's, it's the work of God. Now, let me, let me hasten to say, when people take it away from the work of God and they begin to make it a thing of merchandise, then it ought to be taxed. There are those who have made, uh, we call them charlatans, who have made uh, the work of God into their personal gold mine. And, and I won't belabor the point there, but it's non-taxable. Uh, it's not to be backed just by denominational resources. It was always going to be cared for by the people of God. When the, whenever the, the temple fell into disrepair in the Old Testament, and when you see it in the early church in the book of Acts, the people were all together and they brought, in fact, we read how many of them who had houses and lands, they sold them. And they brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I don't think anybody preached that or taught that, but they got some heavenly priorities. And they realized, this world's not my home. I'm just passing through. What do I need all this stuff for? And so they, they gave sacrificially to the Lord's work. I was talking now with Brother Wallace, I think, this week. I thought, you know, that struck me as I read that. They had houses and lands and they sold them. Was that, was that extra? An extra house they had? Or was that extra land? Or was it where they lived? Did they, the Bible doesn't say. How did, they, how did they get by? How did they live on? It doesn't say. It just said none of them lacked. God took care of every one of them. They got their priorities right. Oh, that we'd be willing to sacrifice. Willing to sacrifice. Most of us give from our plenty, not from sacrifice. Years ago, back in the 70s, there was a comedian named Flip Wilson. He had one of his characters he did was a preacher. He was a preacher at the at the What's Happening Now church. He did a skit and he told about the preacher and he'd shout out. He said, if this church is going to serve God, it's got to get down on its knees and crawl. And then the congregation, the audience, would yell back to the preacher, make it crawl, preacher, make it crawl. Now like the, the black churches would do, they would go back and forth with the preacher. Amen, Quentin? Remember those days? And then the preacher was saying, once this church has learned to crawl, then it's got to get up on its feet and walk. And then the congregation would answer, make it walk, preacher. Make it walk. Some of you, who's laughing? Sound like Mary Lou. Mary Lou, you are here. That sounded like you. You probably remember seeing this. Then he said, once this church has learned to walk, this church has to run. And of course, the audience answered him, make it run, preacher, make it run. And then he said, in order to make the church run, we've got to reach deep down in our pockets and we've got to give. And then the congregation answered him, make her crawl, preacher, make her crawl. <laughs> that's, that's about how it goes in many churches. Sad to say. A church can't grow if it doesn't give. And if it doesn't give, it will crawl. A businessman and an attorney were traveling in, around the world and they were seeing many impressive sights, but when they got home, they agreed that something they saw in the country of Korea was the most impressive of all. They walked along a country road in Korea and they saw a boy pulling a plow steered by an old man. It amused the attorney so much he insisted on taking a picture of the scene. 
Later, he showed a picture to a missionary in the next village remarking about this peculiar spectacle he saw. Yes, the missionary said, it does seem like a strange way to plow a field, doesn't it? But I happen to know that boy and that man very well. They're very poor. But when the church was built in this community, they wanted to contribute something. And they did not have any money. They had no grain to spare. And winter was coming on. So they sold their ox. And they gave the money to the church building fund. And now, this spring, minus their animal to plow, they have to pull the plow themselves. The men looked at each other for a moment and thought, what? What an amazing sacrifice. Why did you allow them to do that? And the missionary said they didn't feel that way about it at all. They regarded it as a great joy that they had an ox to give back to the Lord. Sacrificially giving to the work of God. Had the priority of preparation, the priority of participation and then when the people gave it says they gave in verse 7 for the service of the house of God of gold 5,000 talents and 10,000 drams silver 10,000 talents of brass 18,000 talents 100,000 talents of iron and they with whom precious stones were found gave them to the treasure of the house of the Lord by the hand of Jehiel the Gershonite then the people what church Rejoiced, for they offered willingly, because with perfect heart they offered willingly to the Lord. And David the king also rejoiced with great joy. That's your priority of praise. Praising God. They rejoiced, the people rejoiced, King David rejoiced. Hey, they had a real attitude of praise because they got to give. They, they were so uh, thrilled they had an opportunity to give to the work of God. And it was, it's, it's equivalent to the New Testament where the Lord said He likes a cheerful giver. You know, the, the, most, the, the happiest time of the church service should not be when the preacher says amen at the end of the service. And there's a race for the restaurant. Huh? No, you, when should be the happiest time of the service? You know what it should be? The offering. Ought to be, that's when we ought to see the most smiles and, and almost just giddish people think, <laughs> here it comes, I get to give. And, and we're, we're excited about it. They were rejoicing. Hey, I can give to God's work. Everybody, everybody can give. There's a prayer I do not like. I'll tell you the prayer I don't like. Bless those who give and bless those who can't give. I don't think that's a true prayer. Because everybody can give something. That widow was poor as she could be, but she put two mites in. She put something in. Just, just give something. Everybody gives something. And that's the river the rejoicing comes in. A mother wanted to teach her daughter a moral lesson. So she gave the little girl a quarter and a dollar for church. And she told her little girl, you put whichever one of these in the offering that you want. You keep the other for yourself. When they're leaving church, the mother asked her daughter what amount she had given in the offering. Well, the little girl said, I was going to give the dollar, but just before the offering, the man in the pulpit said we should all be cheerful givers. And I thought it would be a lot more cheerful if I gave the quarter instead of giving the dollar. So I did. Now the truth is, we laugh at that and that's cute, but the truth is, she gave according to how she believed. And, and the, the, the growth you want in your Christian life is where you're happier to give more, not less. I mentioned Wednesday night. When you start calculating your tithe, the Lord's tithe down to the penny, you're in trouble spiritually. 
Okay? You don't want to be stingy with God. If there's anybody you don't want to be stingy with, you don't want to be stingy with God. God will take care of you. They were, we ought to be cheerful in praising God because we get to have a part in God's work. We get to have a part in that. God made it. Listen, does God, does God need us? He doesn't. God, God has chosen to use us. He has chosen to include us. And that includes in the salvation of souls. How are people going to hear? They're going to hear because they're preachers. Not, not preachers in a pulpit. Preachers like you and me. Every one of you in here is a preacher. You're a preacher of the gospel. And they're going to hear about Jesus Christ because you're going to tell them about Jesus. When you leave this place, you say, well, uh, you know, the, the, the parak and the, 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 the yoders and the more, they're missionaries. No, you know, every one of you are missionaries. As soon as you walk out that door this morning, everything out there is a mission field. Everywhere you go, you're on the mission field. People need to be reached with the gospel. You're the preacher. Hey, God didn't have to do that, but He included us. He made us part of that so we can rejoice. When someone gets saved, we rejoice bringing our sheaves with us. We're thrilled about that because God, we got to be part of God's work. There's, there's, I don't know, other than getting saved yourself, the next best thing is bringing somebody else to Jesus. Seeing them receive Christ as their Savior. Man, that's the next greatest thing in all the world. Because you get part of that fatted calf when you, and they get saved. Well, it's great to be a part of God's work. God doesn't need us. He says, hey, I'll let you get in on the blessing. He said, you give, and in Malachi he told him, you give and I can open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There won't be room enough to receive. They were thrilled. Notice verse 14. 1 Chronicles 29, verse 14. Well, verse 13, let's read what he said. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise and thy glorious name. Then David says this, who am I? And what? is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. So how, can we, how can the people give like this? How can I give like this? You know how I can give it? Because God has given it to us. God's everything you have, what, have you, what do you have that you have not received? God's given it to you. Are you going to be stingy with what God's given to you? Shouldn't be hard to give back Him. It's His anyway. Amen. Hmm. We're just stewards, remember? What's a steward do? Take care of somebody else's resources. Not mine, it's God's. So when He says He wants some, fine, here. Take it. It's, it's about God. It's not about us. Notice what he said in verse 15. We are strangers before thee and sojourners. As were all our fathers, our days on the earth are as a shadow. There is none abiding. We're not here forever. He said, I'm, by the way, the king is saying this. The king of Israel is saying, I'm just a stranger. Passing through the earth. We're pilgrims, as the New Testament says. So we're, we're, not, we're not worried about laying it up here. Why? This goes by too fast. And we leave it all behind when we go. So Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where, where thieves can break through and steal or where, where moth and rust will corrupt. No, lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Lay it up there. Give, it, give God what's His. Notice verse 16. O Lord our God, all this store that we have prepared to build thee a house for thine holy name cometh of thine hand and is all thine own. It's all yours, God. It goes from His hand to our hand. 
Will we keep it in an open hand or do we close our fist? And God has to pry it out of our fingers. And, and if you don't willingly give it, God will have a way of prying it out of your fingers. Some of you are shaking your head. You've been on that end of things too. Willingly give. We're simply opening our hand and giving it back to Him. Grudge giving is saying, I hate to, but here it is. Duty giving is, okay, I have to, so here. But love giving is, I want to give. I want to give. I, I look forward to giving. David willingly gave. And he's filled with joy because he sees the readiness of the people. Their eagerness to give. This is, this is much like uh, the fellow who, and I, I, I remember, I can't remember when it was that I told this illustration. The man who took his young boy to McDonald's to buy him, bought him a hamburger, a Coke, and then bought him french fries. And he sat down and he's talking to his young boy and he reaches over to get a french fry. And his little boy goes, Mine. Those are mine. Hmm? Dad said, okay. Do you understand? He said, I started, he said, I started thinking to myself, son, don't you realize I'm the one who gave you those fries in the first place? Don't you realize that I can go up to the counter right now and buy as many fries as I want? I don't have to have any of yours. In fact, I can go to the counter and I could tell them, go ahead and, and bury my son in french fries. And they could bring the truck out and bury you in french fries. In fact, I don't need any of your fries, son. I can get my own. All I wanted was you to share a couple fries with me. And he said, and then it hit him. That just as his son behaved with him, is how he was behaving with God. When God asked for something. And all of a sudden he said, it's mine. Can't have it, God. God says, do you realize who gave you those? George Washington's? Realize who gave those things to you? It doesn't just happen to young boys, does it? It happens to grown people too. Bruce Larson wrote, Oh God, the bumper sticker says, Smile if you love Jesus. I smiled all day long and people thought there was something wrong with me. <laughs> the bumper sticker said, Honk if you love Jesus. So I honked and a policeman arrested me for disturbing the peace in a hospital zone. The bumper sticker said, Wave if you love Jesus. So I waved with both hands, but I lost control and ran into the back of a Baptist bus. So God, if I cannot smile or honk or wave, how will Jesus know I love Him? I guess if I love Jesus, I'll give. Honking's way too easy. Be honest. Money's always the big test. It's always the big test. If the church says we need some folks to give some time to something. People say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give my time. I'll come help with that. We need talent. We need somebody with some talent to draw this or make this or do this. Yeah, yeah, I, I can do that. Oh, we need to raise some money for a special offering. Somebody else, not me. Count me out, preacher. Now, now you're getting personal. You know, I was talking to, I don't know who I was talking to, somebody this week. Just thought I'd let you know I do talk to people. And um, sometimes I talk to myself too. And um, intelligent conversation. And, you know, if 12 and a half years ago, you'd have said, you know, in 12 years, 
you're going to have an addictions program that will go into three different prisons. You'll have a group on Friday night that will have 30 to 50, depending on a Friday night. You'll have a, you'll have a radio broadcast that will influence people around Ohio. You'll, you'll have live stream that people will influence. You'll have 71 missionaries that you'll support around the world. He said, you got to be kidding me. I remember, I remember getting asked, some of you, some, a couple of you were here, when we met before the evening service in, in October of 2005, and everybody sat on this section of pews back then. They were asking me questions. I, I think one of them was something about how do you plan to grow the church or what are your plans are for growth, and, you know, I had a real profound answer. I said, I don't know. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? I mean, just going just gonna to tell people about the Lord. We're going to go soul winning. We're going to witness. We're going to preach. But the truth is, God said he'll build the church. But you know, how, you know how those ministries have happened? Because people give. That's how it happens. It doesn't happen if you don't give. The church would still be crawling if you didn't give. The reason those ministries happen is because we have people that are willing to give. And all, I've, all I'm asking this morning is let's not stop that. Let's not stop that. Once we begin to run, let's not go back to crawling. Let's not, I, don't know, I don't know what the next 12 years will bring. I, I couldn't have imagined this 12. I couldn't imagine we are where we are right now. I don't know what the Lord has in store for the next 12. But I don't want Him, I don't want to get to heaven one day, nor do you. And God show us, here's what I wanted to do. But you didn't give. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't have you do it. You see, I, I, I needed you to give and have a part in it. I don't want the blessing to stop at Bible Baptist Church. So let's continue to give. We're only giving what he's given to us anyway. I was talking to somebody on the phone, and they were saying that the particular church they belong to, they don't live here. They said they just, they just have a rule, they don't help anybody. Somebody needs gas, somebody needs food. The answer is no. They don't help anybody. Just flat out, won't do it. And, and he knows the, the, the folks that we help. I, I, don't think, I don't think a week goes by that somebody doesn't, we don't help somebody with something. And, and you, know, you know what's amazing? God sends it back in. The Bible says when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. And that which you've given, he'll repay again. God always takes care of us. I believe with all my heart because we, uh, the, you think, well, how can you, we had a fellow years ago was upset because we had so many missionaries. But you've got to focus on the home front. You know how God takes care of our home front? Because we take care of the missionaries. That's how that works. And, and you, can, you can think otherwise, but, but I know and I've, I'm living otherwise. God takes care of us, and God meets those needs. Heavenly priorities. Heavenly priorities. Preparation, participation, and praise. To God be the glory. Great things he hath done. Let's bow for prayer. Shall we, Father, take the truth here this morning. Thank you for the example here of David, Solomon, and the people, the leaders as they prepared and participated and praised you and the opportunity to build you a house. To be part of doing something for God. Lord, we're not in the Old Testament times and we're not building a temple. We are the temple of God in the New Testament and we're the house of God. But we sure would like to be part of something great for God. And Lord, I'm... 
I'm amazed at what you have done so far through Bible Baptist Church with the people that are in this room. It's surely a testimony of your grace and your power. But Lord, we don't want to limit you. And we want the blessing to continue. And I would pray this morning that each of us would say, God, keep my priorities right. Keep my affection set on things above, not on things on the earth. And I pray, Lord, you'd help us to stay on track, not get sidetracked, not become double-minded, and hinder your work of what you'd like to do in us and through us.